It all started as a joke. No, she has to go out. Oh. I like this girl. I like you. The Holy Spirit is speaking to me to like you. <laughs> I don't think that would be disgusting. Oh. If you ask me, I will show you a We've got to end this. <laughs> and then, conversations got heated. Did you ever, at any point in your life, feel the stigma when it came to your color? What were some of the struggles growing up before you becoming the successful person that I know you are right now? This is all that you missed from Tea with London, season one. Welcome, Princess Fatia and Chroma. Cheers. Cheers. Oh, eye contact. Okay. <laughs> Trust me, if I should tell you hmm. I was overthinking what I should wear for this particular interview. Silly. You might, oh, I knew. She was definitely going to say silly. But trust me, it, I was just thinking, what should I wear for this interview? Whatever you want. Because I was coming to sit with an idol. Now I'm flattered. You just, you, did you just bring me here to embarrass me and make me shy? Definitely not. <laughs> and you know, I know before I got to know you, mm -hmm. You know, we met on Uche's set. Yes, we did. But when I saw you, you were very familiar. And then I, I turned to ask myself, from where do I know this lady? Most of us don't even know what we want until it hits us in the face. The opportunity presented itself. And you took it? Do you have a problem with that? Ah, yes, champagne. It feels like a lifetime ago. I know, right? And then you played as Deborah, Deborah Caesar. Caesar, yes. How was the feeling like playing such a character? Oh, um, I remember, so the, the whole story of how I, I even started to play mm -hmm. Deborah is actually quite interesting. Um, I was in, because back then I was at Lancaster University. And I was at school one day when I got a call from Shirley about coming to Pram Pram to film an episode of a show that she was working on. And when I got there, which is where I met one of my best friends, Kabuki, Kabuki and yeah, Yumi. Exactly. Fuki is such a doll. When I got there, I later found out that the character Deborah Caesar had been recast three times before I showed up. So they were already filming the show. Mm -hmm. They had already cast everyone. They were in the middle of production the first person they had on, for one reason or another, could not do it. The next person they had on, there were some issues with filming. The last person before me could not remember their lines. So it felt as though the character of Deborah Caesar was doomed <laughs> before mm. I even got there. And I get there and everyone's thinking oh god i hope it's not going to be one of another. those it's like oh there's a new, new deborah, deborah scissor. <laughs> <laughs> and and then i get there i meet a few of the cast members and then we do the first scene and it goes swimmingly Fantastic. well no hitches and next thing i know i'm being written fully into the series deborah is an interesting character for me um she wasn't too far removed from my own life experiences. I understand what it means to be the uh, daughter or niece of somebody involved in politics. And her mother was an MP. And at the time, my aunt Samuel was also an MP. Mm -hmm. So it felt somewhat true to self. But we were very, very different in the sense that she was conniving and would do anything to have a taste of power. Mm -hmm. And while I enjoy being powerful in certain circumstances, I, I'm not hungry for it. You don't need power to be able to do good things, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah, she was an interesting character. <laughs> Talking about power, many of us know you as Princess Fatia and Kromer, mm -hmm. the granddaughter of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. Yeah. At long last, the battle has ended. How does that feel like? Oof. 
You would think I would be used to answering this question, but I never am. Um, in a nutshell, I would say, uh, of course, I'm proud of him. I'm proud to be his granddaughter because he has such a tremendous legacy mm -hmm. that, you know, I can only hope to live up to in my own way. However, I also understand that that legacy is not mine. It doesn't belong to me. I think it belongs to all of us as Ghanaians, as Africans, as black people, as people of color. That's true. Because his legacy was for us. us. No. <laughs> not for his family members. So it makes me feel proud not because I am his granddaughter, but because I am an African woman. The title of the play was No F-Words Allowed. Helen's son, Jeff, Nana's daughter, Efwa, and Carolyn's daughter, Chica, gathered all the children on their lunch break and proceeded to demonstrate, acting out and simulating for them the appropriate ways that a man and a woman should engage in a sexual capacity. What? What are you saying? I'm saying that Jeff and Chica, with their clothes on, simulated sex acts. I'm sorry, my chica did uh -oh. what? Gyrating, kissing, scratching, uh -oh. thrusting. I think we get the picture. And again oh. and again and again. And that is your daughter. She narrated the entire encounter with a sort of microphone, which I confiscated. Oh God. <laughs> Let's yeah. talk about you as a person. How was growing up like for you? <laughs> growing up, growing up was interesting. Growing up was interesting. Um, as a as a young child, I think I was influenced by many different cultures and different ways of life, primarily because of my parents and what they exposed me to growing up. I remember, because I started reading fairly early, when I was around six or seven, my mother gave me the diary of Anne Frank. Now I, need a, <laughs> now I need a biscuit break. That's, that's a big book. It's a big book for a tiny little girl, I'll tell you that much. Um, to this day, I'm terrified of bunk beds because there is a chapter in, in the diary where Anne Frank and her sister are sick and they're laying in bunk beds and her sister falls off the bunk bed no. to her demise. And as a child... <laughs> <laughs> Reading about that. You, you think that, you know, all the other heavy themes in the story would have been what I would have gone bunk away ter like super terrified of. Yeah. It was the bunk beds for me, personally. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to see a bunk bed. I definitely don't want to be on top of one. Years later, I would be in <laughs> school at Faith Montessori School, which I went mm -hmm. to at when I was in middle school. And I was sick and I went to the infirmary. They carried me to the infirmary and they put me on the top bunk. Not even on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and when I tell you, <laughs> the most terrifying experience of my life. But um, yeah, um, that should tell you the type of childhood I had. But that's not to say I wasn't allowed to be a child. By all means, I, I played a lot. I, they made sure to help give me as rounded of a childhood as they mm -hmm. could. Um, unfortunately, my mother passed away when I was nine. She had breast cancer. Um, so that, I was very close to her. She taught me so many things that even to this day I feel were very relevant to my life as an adult, which I'm very grateful for because I know that some of the conversations we had even though I was so young, some people who may be teenagers or even adults don't get yeah. to have those conversations with their parents. So I, I commend her for that. But luckily for me, my mother's sister, who was her best friend, they were almost like twins, 
was always a mother to me, even when my mother was alive. I remember being in the first grade and telling my friends I had two mothers. <laughs> I mean, that's, that shows how much love she was, yeah. like, she was just... Yeah, they, they were both my mothers, honestly. I, I made a... I don't know why. I, I told all the kids, oh, they were like, you can't have two mothers. And I was like, well, one of them gave birth to my top half, and the other gave birth to my... And then the doctors had to sew me together. You know, you have, like, good, you have a good, a very good sense of humor that I would always commend. I mean, you know how to keep the conversation. She's like, one gave birth to the top part. That's what I said. I was, I was in, in class one, and people were like, you can't have to. I was like, I do. This is how. <laughs> it, it was a whole thing. They called my mom into the school. Like, she's telling these kids that they gave birth. <laughs> but, yeah, so I was lucky to have my, my, my other mother, Tanti, who is still... Like, one of the greatest loves of my life, honestly. My dad remarried and moved to KT... T no, he moved to Dallas, Texas. And after a while of being in middle school in Ghana, I felt like I wasn't... I wasn't getting what I wanted out of the education system. I, I knew very early on I was a creative. And unfortunately, we don't have the necessary or at the time at least we and even now i think it, the same can be said we don't have the necessary resources to educate young people interested in the art to the level that they, they need, need to be early on to fully pursue their interest so i spoke to my uncle and my aunt and then my dad as well and they're like okay do you do you want to move to the u.s and you know, go to high school there instead. And I was like, yeah, okay. And I ended up living with my uncle instead of my dad in, in the US because there was this really good school. We, they were both in Texas, but in KT, Texas, there was this really good school that had a really good theater program. Mm -hmm. They had this speech and debate competition which involved dramatic interpretation, humorous interpretation, which I ended up doing and competing and winning like tournaments. Okay. <laughs> and I, I hope like, you certainly win this game I have after this. Oh interview. my God, <laughs> you're stressing me. He's been talking about this this interview game but since I got here this morning. Trust me. And I'm 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 shaking in my boots and I didn't even wear boots. <laughs> but um, so I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. So I went there and it revitalized my love for acting, acting. and theater. And I also discovered that I had a love for psychology as well. But through all of that, I also loved law because my uncle, um, lawyer Kotoan Pao, is one of the most brilliant minds mm -hmm. I've ever witnessed. And I, I'm lucky to- To be related to him? Not just that, like he, he's like my, my second father, really. I live with him right now. And he has as well taught me a lot of the things I know and a lot of the principles that I live my life by. So I said, I definitely want to do, do the law because I've seen what the understanding of the law does for a person. And I want to change the world, as pretentious as that sounds. And unfortunately, many of the laws that seem to govern us do not reflect us as a whole. whole. Yeah. And you can't enact change if you do not understand the foundation of what already exists. True. So I said, I, I'm going to do law. How am I going to do all of this? <laughs> exactly my question, because it's like, we, I know you sing. I know you act. You are a good singer. Thank you. A Thank good you. actor. I One of your lines I would never forget is from Little Problems. You smell like stinking breath and bad that's decisions. Not, see, you said you're not going to forget the line, but you forgot the line. <laughs> Wait, you, you hey, smell like... Okay, you got the first half. I'll give you that. And who are you supposed to be? Bio. You smell like sweat and bad decisions. Here's the thing. In order to be a very well-rounded actor, you need to understand 
most of these because when you're acting it's not just about you sure it's about you and your relationship with the director and your relationship with your scene partners and sometimes your scene partner is a human being sometimes your scene partner is the room you're in sure and depending on who your scene partner is i think sometimes might inform the techniques that you use. You knew this whole time. Of course I knew. Some of us just pretend to be stupid. What? Oh, nothing. Are you trying to say that I'm stupid? I don't think she was trying. I just think sometimes you can be a little bit... A little what, Helen? Go on, say it. A little bit naive. Gullible. Mindless. I mean, your husband, Kwame. Come on, Nana, you're a lawyer, for Christ's sakes. How could you not have known after all these years? Huh? The fraud? The, the schemes? The embezzlement? Honey, we're talking about the FBI here. The American FBI. He's going to prison for a very long time. How long have you been waiting to say that? No, I don't mean to be a malignant oh, cancer. Oh, it's just... Excuse me, Miss Helen Forsen, Miss fucking Universe. It was the Miss World pageant, oh, actually. Miss, my life is so shiny, so spotless, so fucking perfect. My wealthy parents had to pay my way into Yale. Harvard? Harvard. <laughs> and then I married my husband, who just so happens to be my fucking cousin. Three all times removed. All that stolen money in the family. But he can't even keep his pencil of a dick inside his pants. He's out here spreading his seed all across the continent of freaking Africa with multiple babies outside the marriage and you just sit there and you take it because you know deep down, without him, you're nothing. You don't work, you don't have a career, you do nothing. You just pretend to have so much of everything when at the end, Helen, you have nothing. Now, how long have you been wanting to say that? This lady is Magnificent. Ah, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You're really that. good. I appreciate um, Before I come to my next question. Yes. So far, you've worked with tons mm. of act. Um, I mean, directors. You've worked with Jenna Du. You've worked with Uche. You've worked with Shirley. You've worked even on Trisha. I did. I did work on Living with Trisha. That's true. Yeah. I. I you know. I did. And then my I research was right. Your research is very right. But yeah. quite interestingly. Pair my research, there's no much to look for for you. Yeah. It's like you Google Princess Fatia and Kuma, and you are close to little or no information about mm -hmm. you. Why? No real information. No it's real, very, exactly. It's very surface so, stuff. Like, there's a lot of articles, but they're always about like one post that I made, or like, oh, it was her birthday, or she did this, or exactly. something happened. Um, I, I don't know how to explain this. I, I don't put myself out there Why? as much. I mean, for somebody, what? somebody go like, come on, I am in Koma's granddaughter. I'm not saying I you mean, should rob classism <laughs> in the face of people, but at least it's, we don't get to know what you're working on. It's not about that, you know, and also in recent years, I haven't, I haven't worked on too much. I'm, I've been more interested in doing the work on becoming good at the things I need to become good at. I just got my LLB. Congratulations. Thank you. So I was working on making sure I got that. I was working on, you know, honing my craft, becoming a better actor. That takes time, that takes True. study. I realized that if, if it's something that you want to do, instead of, and sure, some people work on the job, Mm -hmm. I've done quite a few things. I, I, I've, I know what it's like to work on the job. But besides, you know, just going to auditions and, you know, booking jobs, mm -hmm. do the work behind the scenes. Do the work at home. Do the work in school. Build up, you know, the craft. And then go out to auditions. And then, you know, put yourself out there. So I think that I, I've only recently started putting myself out there because I feel like I am at a place where I am comfortable with the work that I'm going to be putting out. Great. You know? 
Like I recently shot Single Not Searching with uh, Lisa Ray McCoy. Mm-hmm. And I'm very excited for that. I am excited for you, actually. The character is interesting. Like if you thought... <laughs> If you thought that Adra was something, wait, wait till you. <laughs> I watched that movie. Wait then. till you meet her. Her name's Effia, so I'm, I'm excited for people to meet Effia on Single Not Searching. Can we? Yeah, it's 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 a big project. Um, it was an interesting set. Mm-hmm. I think having all those you know different mindsets and cultures like um, coming together. We had. Nigerian actors, people who were Liberian Ghanaian, we had the American actors, and then we had the Ghanaian actors, and just coming together to make something, something. It, it, was, it was an experience, to say the least. So yeah, my presence on the internet is small, but rightfully so, I think. And I think that as I continue to grow, both as a person and an actor, and I become more comfortable with you know, putting out work, which I, I think we're going to start doing. I mean, we're doing, we just made The Kids Are Not All Right. Mm-hmm. And London, by the way, was one of, it, the movie wouldn't have happened without London How? Being there. The movie no, definitely I, wouldn't have happened no, without no, them. No, not really. The last day of filming, let me tell you, and I was a producer on it as well, I was, I had never been that stressed in, in my your life. life. Because I had one of the most challenging scenes that day. Mm -hmm. And then on top of it, we had, you know, some filming stuff going on. And London came through. London came through. You you brought in those beautiful kids. And when I say it, it it wouldn't have been the same film without you. That's the truth. And I'm so grateful. And I'm so grateful to you guys for actually having me to work on the film, because I mean, I, I was privileged enough to work with great actors, great director, oh. great producer. Great cinematographer. Let's you, not forget Dennis. You know, that's He's what I was coming to. The and then one thing about that set, I'm not going to lie, is the commitment, mm. the communication, and the love, most importantly. It was a labor of love. It it's like, of I love. felt like I was in a room filled with family members because it's like I could openly be myself and talk to anybody. Like, I'm comfortable talking to anybody. Yeah. I'm comfortable saying, and everybody was ready to listen mm-hmm. and not like, oh, he's just a production assistant or he's, he's basically somebody on set. No, oh, no, I don't no, even, because no. I remember when we were taking your line and then you were supposed to say something and then you jumped it wasn't even anything major yeah but we could have made a go and yeah. i was like oh, i mean princess Wait, the, jump. this line we need to do and then that you were line. like oh really um please london where again and i'm like yeah. oh my gosh she's so humble and then move oh. to gina and move to kabuki everybody was fantastic on the set there was dennis dennis was very open as a cinematographer to actually listen because mm-hmm. i mean I don't really have much ideology when it comes to cinematography. I'm still learning, I should say. Mm-hmm. But I could go like, Dennis, I think this short. And, and then he would listen. And he listened. And he and would I'll, take the advice. And then Uche would be like, what do you think about? And I'm like, oh my God, this is the set I'm talking about. Not to shade no. any person that I've been yeah. on sets with. Because, you was know, we, we've been on some sets. We, exactly, you know, we've been on some horrible sets. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I don't know if I'm contractually allowed to say anything. You but can. We've, but been on, we've been on some sets, and I'm going to yeah, leave it at set. that. <laughs> exactly. Um, but what I will say is that you're absolutely right. There was an abundance of love in the process of making the kids are not all right. And in addition to that love, there was mutual respect. Exactly. Everybody respected each other on That's that true. set. Nobody was looking down on anybody else. No, Nobody was I remember when the kids even came in, yeah. they felt like they were home. You know that thing where kids get on set and they're like, okay, I don't know these people, they're not my family. Yeah. But the kids were all right. The kids were all right. Imagine that. <laughs> the kids were they all were, right. They were supposed to be not they're all right, right, but they were all right. They were pretty all right, if I do say so myself. <laughs> I mean, I'm actually loving this conversation, but don't forget this show is proudly brought to you by Home of H Ghana.
Yadia Herbal Center, Just Men Ghana, and Unique Hema Establishment Limited, producers of Hema Organics. Roll the tape.